Well, uh, Casper, I don't see Ambra, Jordan, or Stoffel, but they're here, maybe not. Um, so thank you very much, Anders, and uh, good luck. Thank you. Uh, and uh, yeah, uh, thank you all for coming to this uh, talk, uh, the last talk of the conference. Uh, it's good to see this, this many here. So I'm Anas Markusen, and uh, I'm presenting the work that I did with uh, my colleagues, uh, Sebastian Boring, Mikkel Rainer Jakobsen, and Kasper Hornbeck. Um, and yeah, before we go into the actual findings of the paper, uh, I'll just talk a little bit about the, the concept uh, and the motivation for doing this thing in the first place. Um, so the question that Off Limits tries to address is essentially very simple. So if we uh, take uh, what's on the display uh, and extend the boundaries with which we can interact, uh, can people actually take advantage of this to, to perform more efficiently when they, um, when they complete tasks? Um, so to take an example, uh, this uh, user in the video is, uh, is the video actually running? Yeah. Uh, this uh, user in, in the view is viewing a map of the US, and he wants to change the viewport to, the, to view Europe instead. And so far, this has often been done with, uh, uh, with either repeated dragging operations uh, using touch or uh, maybe uh, repeated operations doing different mid-air uh, interaction techniques. Um, so uh, if we extended the interaction space uh, in which we can point uh, to be beyond the boundaries of the display, could this person actually just point towards Europe uh, based on what he's seeing on the display and drag it directly on screen instead of having to do these repeated uh, operations? Um, yeah, so why is this interesting at all and how did we uh, end up doing this? Uh, well, throughout my PhD, I've been doing uh, a lot of different interaction techniques for large displays and surprisingly often I've encountered uh, users that gestured towards things that wasn't on the display stating, yeah, I just want to look at this thing out here. Uh, so it seems like people have an intuition about what's, what's beyond the borders of the display. So why not try to use it uh, for something meaningful? Uh, so that's uh, why we chose to look at this. Um, and this has essentially, um, we can do a lot of different things. I mean, maps is one example that has these kinds of relationships, but a lot, a lot of other uh, information spaces have these spatial relationships. And even if they don't, uh, we might actually be able to just have the user define uh, the spatial relations them themselves. <clears throat> so an example of this defining it uh, yourse yourself could be this presentation, for example. So there's really no inherent spatial relationship in, in my slides. But uh, let's imagine that I did... Uh, did the, uh, the accidental and embarrassing thing of putting in a slide that shouldn't be in this presentation. Uh, what, what could I do? Uh, I could, of course, just use my computer and uh, skip ahead, uh, but I could also define my slides as being extending on uh, to the sides of the display. So if I wanted to skip a slide, I could just point towards its location in off-screen space, and then I could essentially just drag it onto the display really quickly so nobody would even notice my mistake. That's, of course, uh, one way of doing it, right? Um, so, um, so this concept, um, well, we found it interesting and we wanted to explore it more. Um, and essentially, we wanted to do a study to figure out if, if it actually made sense to do this at all. Can users take advantage of it? So we wanted to compare it uh, to uh, some baseline techniques. And uh, one baseline technique uh, being touch, it's a very frequent technique to use on large displays. Um, and the task that we were doing to perform this was essentially a 1D dogging task. So you can see um, it's a line of numbers. Uh, the person in front of the display has to move a specific number into this, di this display and dog it at the center of the screen. Um, the second baseline technique was a mid-air pointing based technique. And uh, in this technique, uh, people could point off screen, but nothing would happen out there. So essentially, when they did point to the screen, uh, the interactions would happen. Uh, and as you see, uh, yeah, people actually used this technique quite efficiently uh, because we added some features that made it possible to uh, automatically uh, let go when you left the screen. So, so it actually worked quite well. Um, the last technique, of course, was our uh, off-screen pointing technique. Uh, 
we chose this to be uh, just a naive ex linear extension of what's uh, on the display. So essentially the scale would uh, radiate to both sides uh, from the display uh, in the plane of the display. So people had to sort of extrapolate positions of numbers in this, uh, in this plane. So we had 12 participants complete the experiment, uh, each of which did uh, one, 180 dogging tasks. Uh, and each participant tried all three techniques. Uh, and this was, of course, counterbalanced uh, the presentation order. Um, the results uh, showed that touch was slower than the midair conditions. Uh, that in itself is actually an interesting result. It's uh, slightly different than previous work has found. Uh, and this indicated that this kind of task actually uh, is a good task for off-screen pointing. So people can take advantage of, of uh, uh, sorry, mid-air pointing. People can actually take advantage of mid-air pointing in this uh, kind of task. Uh, but the mid-air techniques, though, they were, were very similar. Um, and I'll get back to this in a minute. Um, uh, we also had the hypothesis that, well, if you allow people to point in a larger space, people will have to do less operations. So, so we, we would expect to see uh, significantly fewer uh, interactions with the, the, to, to complete a task. Um, and essentially, that's also what we saw here. So off-screen pointing definitely reduced the number of, of operations needed to complete the, the tasks. So getting back to this similarity in performance, um, well, the data that we had didn't allow us to do any conclusive uh, uh, draw any conclusions on on why this is. Uh, but during the experiment, we did do some interesting observations. Um, so essentially, a very important thing that we observed was that people initially tried to point directly to the number that they wanted to uh, bring onto the display, um, and they figured out, okay, I'm undershooting here. So. Essentially, when they tried to point to, late, let's say, the number 50, they would undershoot the number, uh, meaning that they would essentially grab hold of maybe 30 instead, a number that's closer to the display. And people started to adjust to this uh, quite quickly. And this, ha has, uh, this had the, uh, the unfortunate side effect that when people actually adjusted to this and started to point further away, uh, when they did the harder tasks that were further away from the display, they would sometimes overshoot. And because we had this planner extension of the display, if you actually point 90 degrees to the display, you'll be pointing at infinity, essentially. Uh, so people sometimes ended up quite far away from the task that they actually wanted to solve. And this, uh, having experienced this maybe one or two times, people started to narrow in the space in which they operated. So essentially, they were uh, only using off-screen pointing in closer proximity to the display. Um, so that might at least be part of the explanation. <clears throat> but we found this um, undershooting behavior to be uh, quite interesting, and we wanted to understand this further. Um, it seems people had a different perception of uh, where numbers was located in, located in off-screen space, even though they were instructed that this linear extension was there, so they could imagine the size of the display and extrapolate from that. But um, yeah, we, uh, it, it seems like they did differently in practice. Um, so it indicated that the linear extension was maybe not the best match. So we decided to run a new study uh, that would allow us to understand this better. Um, and I'll not go into too much detail about the design of the study. You can find the details in the paper. But essentially, we asked people to point to particular numbers in all screen space uh, and have them uh, assess where these were. Um, <clears throat> and we had 15 participants do uh, 384 specific tasks each. Uh, so we got quite a lot of data out of this. Um, so this plot um, shows the mean pointing value uh, per task per participant. So um, the x-axis represents uh, the values that people were presented. So in essence, the number that they have to point to. And the y value shows. Uh, the value that they actually produced if, you, if the computer did the extrapolation for them, right? Um, and as we can see, um, there's actually quite a bit of uh, uncertainty associated with this off-screen pointing. Uh, that's also expected, of course, because uh, yeah, people had no feedback to what they were doing out there. Uh, 
But we also see that um, that it gets very uncertain quite quite fast. Um, and we also see that the undershooting behavior that we hypothesized was there is actually there. Uh, so the curve uh, flattens as you go further away from the display, meaning that people, on average, undershot the target they intended to, to hit. So based on this, we created a model to try to predict uh, what people were pointing at. Um, and you may notice that this is in degrees, uh, which is a different, uh, different, uh, um, yeah, a different value than the other one. Uh, it's essentially because we uh, converted into degrees uh, from pointing perpendicular to the display, and that's because this uh, space essentially provided us, provided us with the best fitting model. Um, so uh, the purpose of the model was to. Um, essentially do a prediction, uh, not maybe the perfect prediction, but try to correct for this undershooting in a way that would be transparent to the user, uh, and um, essentially in a way that you could apply it in real time without the user really noticing. Um, so um, the model has three different parts. Uh, essentially it has on-screen values, it has positive off-screen values, and it has negative off-screen values. Um, and don't go. Don't worry too much about this uh, uh, this formula. It's in the paper if you're interested. But uh, you can notice here on the top figure that what the model essentially does is to compress the interaction space that that participants are working within. Um, and that, of course, uh, makes uh, a difference to how uh, people interact. Okay. So having improved our understanding on how users point. Uh, in off-screen space, we wanted to see if we could actually use this information to improve interaction. Um, so we uh, created a new interaction technique. Uh, we called it off-limits. Uh, I'll get back to the name there. But uh, anyways, uh, the technique had two major differences from the naive approach from experiment one, which was what we compared it to. Um, so the first difference was that we applied the cor correction model that we created. Uh, so people uh, would essentially have their undershooting corrected. Um, the second difference was that we introduced a limit as to how far away from the display people could point. Uh, so we just observed that uncertainty gets very high uh, once you point away from the display. So we introduced a limit as to uh, make sure that people only worked in, in the area that was somewhat certain. Uh, and that area is essentially about five times the display width. Uh, so it's actually quite a, uh, it's quite a large extension to both sides. I mean, it's, you have a display, a space of 10 times the display uh, width to work within. Okay, uh, so taking a look at the results, we saw that off screen, uh, off limits was uh, generally faster than off screen. Uh, the naive approach when, uh, when targets move further away from the display. That's also what we expected since we now allowed people to actually point further away. People actually did start taking advantage of a much larger part of off-screen space than before. Uh, and people directly stated that they did so because they knew they wouldn't go away uh, from, from where they expected to be. Further, uh, this uh, is uh, the number of uh, interactions that we uh, participants had to do to uh, complete the task. And as you can see, uh, off-limits is even smaller here than, than the off-screen technique is. And if you remember back to the, the previous uh, study, we've, we actually found that, uh, that off-screen was already much lower than the others. So this is uh, quite a significant uh, reduction in the number of operations that, that you have to do to complete the tasks. And um, finally, all uh, 13 participants in this study preferred off-limits over the, the regular off-screen technique. So to illustrate the potential of off-screen pointing, uh, we developed a few example applications. Uh, the applications were developed uh, to work with the Microsoft Connect, uh, as well as the OptiTrack motion capture system that we used throughout our studies. Um, and we did so to show that, that off-screen pointing is actually feasible even with current consumer-grade technology. Um, so we developed uh, three applications, an interactive map uh, slash satellite image explorer. Uh, we uh, 
did an application that enabled uh, navigation of high-resolution pathology samples. Uh, and finally, we also tried out uh, on, uh, on astronomy, astronomy image, imagery. Um, so all of these uh, examples are 2D. Um, and as we saw um, on the, sorry, as we saw on, in our studies, we were working in 1D. So that's, of course, a limitation. And future work will need to look at how this works in 2D. However, our application uh, application seems to indicate that it'll work quite well. Uh, secondly, uh, we extend uh, we should extend and improve this model to account for display sizes. We only used one display size, uh, and also have the user be mobile in front of the display, so essentially different distances to the display um, to make it more generalizable. And finally, we looked uh, quantitatively on this problem. Uh, it would be quite interesting to do uh, some qualitative study because we got quite a lot of good feedback from the users that we c could uh, probably uh, use to, to improve this concept even further. And just uh, to quickly sum up, uh, we evaluated the feasibility of off-screen pointing for large displays. Uh, we studied users' perception of off-screen space. Um, we created an initial model uh, of off-screen pointing behavior. Uh, it's not the perfect model, it's, but it's a model that's transparent to the user. Uh, and finally, we designed off-limits, uh, an input-corrected off-screen interaction technique uh, that allows users to take advantage of a much larger interaction space than, than previously seen. Um, and yeah, with that, I'd like to thank you all for listening uh, and open up for questions. <clears throat> okay, so we have four minutes for questions. Hi. Hello. Hi. I'm Xiao Jun B from Google. Very uh, good work. Question. I felt one challenge of using this off limit technique that when you point to off screen content, they don't know where, where the content is. Have you considered like, using some visualization technique to indicate user where content is, like Halo or other techniques? or like error to show that you can point to that and drag? Um, yes, we did consider so, uh, but we chose in this uh, work to focus on unassisted off-screen pointing in the sense that we only presented people with a scale or, uh, on the display and people had to, from the scale, extrapolate positions in off-screen space. So, so we, I'm, I'm sure the, the, the uncertainty would be improved quite radically if we did at these um, uh, helpers to as to assess the distance but we wanted to look at sort of the worst case scenario uh, if we had people do this uh, kind of thing in all screen space hi uh, thanks for the talk Doug Bowman Virginia Tech um, two questions one is it seems like that the difficulty in estimating where a number would be on that scale is partially due to the fact that it's like a planar um, visualization and you know the farther you go the you know a tiny amount of movement with your hand results in a huge movement in that planar space um, so I wondered if you considered a, a cylindrical space instead so you point around a circle as opposed to pointing on a flat wall and then the second question is related which is I wonder if the the size of the room where the display is also has something to do with what the user can can understand if if if, I, if the display is ten times wider than it, it is of that picture that display is outside the room. It may be hard for me to figure out where that display might be. It's, of course, uh, something we have to, uh, to consider and worry about. Uh, we chose to do a simple planner extension uh, simply because the data uh, sets that we were considering had a planner, uh, plannerly well-defined relationship. Uh, so we wanted to try to stay as close to uh, what the user perceived the data to be like uh, and s see if this could actually extend. So that's why we stayed in a, in a planner world. Um, you could actually also see it as an advantage that, that you get more uh, like sensitivity when you point further away. So on a map, if you want to go to like the neighboring city, uh, you could probably do it with quite good accuracy. Uh, but if you want to go from New York to Japan, for example, there's going to be a, a huge uncertainty, and maybe we could actually use this uncertainty uh, to do some intelligent 
automatic zooming to say, okay, let's zoom out when we are going to Asia from New York because we don't know exactly where you're going. So, so we actually saw it as a possibility as well. We haven't looked into it though, but uh, some of our of our demo applications actually use this um, uncertainty to uh, to try to help people uh, in navigating. And what was the second question? Uh, yeah, uh, so um, so yes, I'm pretty sure the room will have an effect, but we did have a relatively large room. Uh, we also, actually for the second study where we wanted to study pe uh, people's perception, we covered the room in black fabric to sort of minimize stimuli. Uh, and uh, of course you can still see that the, the room is uh, is has a wall, but, but when it's quite dark in the room, you, you don't notice it that much, actually. Uh, so, so we try to minimize the effect of the room, but, but of course, it would make sense to evaluate it in other rooms as well. Okay, so we're coming to the end of the session now. So I just want to point out four good things that I wanted to say. We had uh, four good talks. Um, please vote for these good talks. If you see this one in the good talks now, there's an app, so please vote. Um, we're not done with the conference. We have a coffee break, and we've got uh, a good... Um, grand ball.